appropriate for tonight. She says, all three places, talking about Baytown, Goose Creek, and Pelly, our Tri-Cities, all three places voted in what to name the three towns, Baytown, Pelly, or Goose Creek. I voted in that election and was very bitterly opposed to having it named anything but Goose Creek. Baytown won, but lost all of its business. Pelly lost its name and its business, and Goose Creek lost its name, but gained all of the business. I wonder. I wonder if past his prologue, what she would think about St. Jesus and Mall. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, when Ann Sprout uh, moved to Baytown in 1983 uh, with her husband Jim and four boys, and she's been very active in Baytown since that time, we were very lucky that when Ann moved here, she moved here hoping that she could work with the museum, and that has come to pass. Well, Audrey said that I'm Ann Sprout. According to my five-year-old nephew, I'm not. I'm the Lady Elaine Fairchild of Baytown. And I don't think many of you probably don't know who Lady Elaine is, but she is the curator of the Merry-Go-Round Museum on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I think that was kind of clever that he would know what I did. But my job as curator at the Baytown Historical Museum is to catalog, uh, record, and interpret all the artifacts that are given to the museum. Uh, everything that's given to the museum has to be recorded. And I'm going to explain to you the process because I think sometimes people wonder what happens to the things they give the museum. And we're trying to institute a policy of the very first thing that you do if you had something you wanted to give to us, Sarah does, is she needs to fill out a gift of deed form. And I'm not going to let her leave until she tells me everything she knows about what she's bringing me. Who's in the photograph? I didn't grow up here and I don't know all the people. I want to know who's in the photograph, why it's important, why the piece of paper is important. So if you have something you want to give us, be prepared to spend 15, 20, 25 minutes with us asking you questions about it. After you fill out the gift of deed form and leave, then everything gets a number and a session number. If it's given in the year like 86, and it was the very first thing that was given in 1986. Its number would be 86.1. And the, art, the paper that Sarah wants to give is one thing, so its number would be 86.11. And it would be written down with her name as the donor, her address, her phone number, what it is. All the information that she put on the gift of deed form would be on this too. After that's done, then a catalog card's filled out. So if you gave something to the museum and you wanted to know if we still had it, we ought to be able to tell you if we still have it. And we ought to be able to find it pretty quick. And that's not always the case right now, but we're hoping to make that the case. Uh, we will accept anything you have that pertains to Baytown, Pelly, Goose Creek, uh, the surrounding Bay Area, anything you have we would like to have. Uh, right now we're particularly looking for artifacts that pertain to the day-to-day -day life. Uh, I have a bus token and a picture of the city bus that ran from in the 1930s and 40s, something I know nothing about, and that's all. So if anybody has anything about the day-to-day -day life of this area, we would really like it. If you haven't been to the museum lately, you need to know that the museum is arranged chronologically. We start with prehistoric times. Yes, there were mammoths and wild horses that lived here long before any people. Uh, next come the Indians, and we're very grateful to the Ross Sterling Indian Studies class for doing uh, a case for us, some reproductions, some pots they did in the same method that the Indians did. We have cases that have French and Spanish artifacts in them, the Texas Revolution and early residents. And I think it's very important to know that the early residents in this area were very well educated. They were involved in the revolution. They were 
educated people and they wanted their children educated. We're talking about David Burnett, uh, De Zavala, even Sam Houston brought his bride to Cedar Point. So our area is very well rooted in history. One of the things we have is a four pounder, which is a cannon ball that was found at San Jacinto prior, or where San Jacinto Monument is now located prior to the construction of the monument, and it was given to us by Ray Harvey. In the Texas Republic uh, collection, we have a lot of things from Asheville Smith's home, a brick, a photograph of his plantation, which he called Evergreen, and the children who come to the museum always want to know why it was a plantation, because if you look at the picture of the house, it doesn't look anything like Tara looked in Gone with the Wind. So. Uh, and we also have a painting that was done by Rosemarie Thompson's father of Asheville Smith. We have uh, cases that talk about statehood, the Civil War, the Bayland Orphanage. Uh, we have artifacts that were found in the Bayland Orphanage area, old irons and spoons. Uh, the life of Goose Creek, Cedar Bio, the early days of Pelly, Goose Creek, Baytown, Wooster, Elena, or Highlands. And of course, we have a very extensive uh, Umble Oil and Refinery, Refining Company uh, collection, or I, it's HOR on all the things that I catalog. <laughs> Plus, we have the Showlander Room. John Showlander was a poet. He was also a farmer that lived here, and we're very proud of our Showlander Room. From time to time, we have special exhibits. Currently, we have a centennial exhibit uh, that has to do with memorabilia from the uh, 1936. We have a walking cane and a hat. And my favorite thing, which Lonnie DeCamp gave us, is a Plaster of Paris model of the San Jacinto Monument. And it says on it, 1936. Now, the monument was not built in 1936. The ground was broken in 1936. And on the bottom is stamped San Jacinto Memorial uh, Monument and Museum. And in pencil is written, in 1940, we picnicked at the monument, and it has a bunch of people's names, Adele and Billy, and, you know. And I took it over to the monument, and they said, I'm not sure. I think maybe they made these early to raise money to build the monument. So we're real glad to have that. We have an exhibit that has life at the community center. We have millions of photographs that I don't know the people in, and I would love to have somebody come and help me identify some of these people uh, at humble day picnics, at dances, at uh, teas, at showers. Uh, we do have an extensive medical exhibit. I actually believe we have enough medical equipment and to uh, open an obstetrician's office. I think that's what most of it is. <laughs> So you need to come by the museum. Uh, one of the things Bill said, and I didn't think about it till just a little bit, we are getting ready to move. We're going to move from the old Exxon Credit Union to the old post office. So uh, we have a lot of materials right now that we cannot put out, a lot of artifacts. We just really don't have room or the cases for. One of them is a set of letters given by Mrs. Beverly that belonged to the Wooster family, and they're letters that Quincy Wooster wrote to his daughter in Iowa. And I want to read you just a portion of the letter. It's dated October the 1st, 1900, so it's immediately following the storm at Galveston. It says, the month of September I believe to have been the hottest of any month I have ever seen in Texas. Scarce a day that the thermometer was not above 90 and only one morning below 74. It seems almost on be beyond belief that a pestilence did not sweep Galveston. The wind was very favorable for us in regards to direction, and we had no disagreeable smells. We found my loss of cattle to have been more than at first supposed. I can't prove 10 missing. The boys have found four, which were washed over Burnett Bay, but one of them got overheated coming home and died, leaving six still unaccounted for. It is possible some of the others may still be found. Ida's cow was found alive and not much injur injured north of the San Jacinto River or a mile or two north of Lynchburg. 
and safely reached home. So if you stop and think about the cow, reached home very safely. And we have things like that that really give you an insight into what the daily life was like in the area. We also are very lucky to have the John Kilgore papers. Now they came into our possession uh, in a roundabout way. They were found at Bayshore Toyota in the safe, just kind of stuck back there in these boxes that they never had looked at. And the first set of things they brought us contained uh, deeds to people's property. I think John Kilgore loaned people, he put up curb and guttering for people and would take, anyway, they would borrow money on their house, <laughs> take a lien on their house, and when they paid him back, he'd give it back to them. Also, uh, all his tax notices, uh, the land he owned, not only in this county, but also in Chambers County. And one of the interesting things that has come lately are a series of checks from 1932 to 33. And one of the things that I've discovered is that he paid in 1932 in June a grocery bill to A&P, it was $28.32. His HL&P, his Houston Light and Power bill, was $1.16. <laughs> He paid his maid $8 a week in 1932. So it's uh, when you work, when you catalog thousands of things that belong to one person, you really start to feel like you know them. Uh, Raymond Kilgore's report cards were also in these things, stuck down in all his father's papers. And it was kind of interesting to see that. And there was also a case, I guess Raymond, I don't, I've never met him, but I guess he was in school in Dallas. And he ne must have needed money because he took a university bank check, scratched it out and put Security State Bank, which was the bank that his father did business here, wrote out cash, $2, signed John Kilgore by Raymond Kilgore, and it went through. It was cashed. <laughs> and if I'd known that when I was young, that they would do that. <laughs> I brought show and tell because it's much more fun. This is a ledger that we have just gotten in. Uh, it is from a store, and we're not exactly sure which store. Uh, it was brought in by John Darlin on Market Street. One of the, you can look at it later. It lists people's accounts and how much they paid for snuff, which was 75 cents, and a soda was 15. But there's one entry here. A Hattie, a Hattie Bell paid for all her groceries by doing washing. It would have her soap and her butter, and then it would say, buy washing, and it would give her a credit of a dollar, and then buy washing and give her a credit of, of a dollar. So that's interesting. Lately, also, we've had uh, Mr. J.B. Allen, who is Joe Allen's father, called us with a story and said, what do you know about the whale boat, the whaling ship that docked at Exxon during the war? I mean, it's World War II. And uh, he said, has anybody ever told you about that? I've got some artifacts from that whaling ship. And we got to talking and said, well, bring them on down. So he brought them all down. And this is a whale eardrum. And it looks like a person. It looks like the man in the moon. And what he told us, the story he's told us, is that the whaling ship came in and offloaded the whale oil at Shell. Now, Shell did buy whale oil, and they used it in, as a lubricant in all their big machineries because it's waterproof, with more waterproof than regular. Then they came over to Umbel to unload fuel oil. And the men on the ship gave away to the people who were loading the ship these whale eardrums. And so, it's kind of neat. You won't see that in a case if you come because we don't have room for it. Uh, another thing, we have the very extensive Showlander collection of his poems and his watch and his wife's picture and we have a quilt that his uh, granddaughter has done that's on loan. And several years ago after home tour, a lady came over from Channel View, Dorothy Robson, and she said, I have, I have all these books. She brought them with her and she said, they've been in the family and I didn't know what to do with them. And these were books that other poets at the time had sent to John Showlander, some for his criticism. He critiqued some of them right there in the book. And then some he just, they were just sent to him. 
This one's from Veda Stewart Montgomery, and it's low-keyed in other poems. It says, to my good friend, John P. Showlander, Dean of Texas Poets. This, this book is signed with the author's best wishes. And uh, there are a hundred books like that that are all autographed to Don Showlander. Uh, we have no place for them. As I said, we have extensive photographic collection of early Goose Creek, early Pelly, uh, early Baytown, early Wooster. We have lots and lots of photographs. We also have an extensive clothing collection. One of our oldest articles of clothing is a 1860 green wool traveling dress, long traveling dress. Uh, we have over 30 hats. I looked and looked for a hat I could wear, but I'm not a hat person, and all of them look kind of funny on me. Uh, we, the museum and the Heritage Society will do a style show if anybody wants us to. Uh, we'll be more than happy to do that. We have so many things that are so interesting and so I think so neat. And like I said, when you spend two years of your life literally cataloging thousands of things, we have all the photographs uh, for the Coin Your Ideas. Everybody that won an award for the Coin Your Ideas. And I mean, it was like 3,000 pictures. And on the back, it tells how much money they got, 10, 15, $25. You really feel like you know some of these people intimately. Uh, we have a collection of ladies' fans. We have a pencil collection that belonged to Cecil Cooper, who ran a dairy here in Goose Creek from 1930 to 1941. It has like 60 pencils. They're all from businesses in this area that have the name and the telephone number. We have a parking meter collection bag, a leather parking meter collection bag that they used to get the money out of the parking meters that came from the city and it goes over your shoulder and you just fit it in. I guess you had to have a key. You fit it in and the money would go in it and it, was, it would block itself so you couldn't get in and get the money. Uh, we have recently been given a lot of railroad memorabilia by James Bitts. Uh, there is a ticket that has never been used for the Beaumont, Sour Lake, and Western Railroad. Now, I don't think it runs anymore, but we have a ticket. Uh, there are also a lot of political buttons in the things he, he gave and wherever, I think he must have been a Republican or must be because there was an I like Ike, several I like Ike buttons and, and those kind of things. We have a reel from the Oiler Theater that still has film on it. I don't know what the film is, but we have it. And we also have uh, three Goose Creek ballot boxes. If you came to the Christmas Tree Fantasy, you got to see one of them. That was number three. They still have ballots in them that are marked. They were sealed up evidently after they were counted and locked up. And we have one, they're precinct one, Goose Creek, and we have one, three, and four. I don't know what happened to two. That was probably the elusive, elusive box. Uh, we have uh, the C.R. Myers collection. C.R. Myers was the mayor of Baytown. His papers were rescued by a neighbor. Somebody else bought the house and they were cleaning out the attic and saw this trunk out by the garbage. And they went and brought it to the museum. It's full of photographs of this area, early area. Uh, photographs of Mr. Myers when he was young. We have enough office equipment to equip an office. We have a typewriter, a Rolodex. Mr. Kelly gave us a cash register that came from St. James House. Uh, we have a, two old telephones. Uh, the bus token that I had. Uh, and the doctor's equipment. This is the bus tokens in here. And uh, it just says bus token. That's all it says. It says TTC on it. I really, I really enjoy what I do. I like it a lot. It's kind of like getting to play in your grandmother's attic or getting to sit at the top of the stairs and watch the party from the top of the stairs or getting to review somebody's life after they've already lived it. Uh, I saved my favorite artifact in the whole museum for the last, and you get to listen to it. It's the Goose Creek Stomp, and it's by Mart, M-A-R-T, not Mark, Mart Britt and his orchestra. I'm sure they were very famous. And it was donated by Arthur Woods, and we're going to play it on this phonograph that's 
about 75 years old. It was bought in San Antonio and given to us by Otto and Clara Gerber. If I did it right, You say the words Baytown Museum, one name comes to mind automatically, and that's Jean Shepherd. Uh, Jean is with us, so now's your chance to ask any question, anything you ever wanted to know about the museum or the society. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. Did you say uh, this went on till nine o'clock? Good, I have an hour, so just settle back. We'll get with this now and see what we can talk about. Because I have never ceased to find words to talk about the Bay Area Heritage Society and the Historical Museum. Looking out here tonight, I see a lot of people who've made this organization very successful. It's not just a one-man show. It's the entire city show. We would like to make it that way. Because the heritage is very rich in Baytown, and it's something that we should cherish and something that we should strive to preserve. And when we found the little Exxon building, I was so delighted, even though it didn't have a roof on it and it had pigeons roosting in it and everything else, and it looked like it was never be brought to, to life, but it was by a hardworking crew. We have outgrown that. And now you look at the old post office and you say, oh my goodness, here we go again. Pigeons roosting there too. <laughs> but at least it has a roof on it. But, uh, but we do have pigeons. But we're looking forward to soon moving to the post office, which is about triple our size of the museum, triple about our size of budget, and a lot of work is ahead of us but we'll be able to display just about anything we have in the museum to tell the story. Anne has done a fine job of cataloging, and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to the Baytown Museum when uh, Jim and Anne moved to Baytown and, and Anne came to, uh, to the museum. Of course, she's a Liberty County gal. Her, her roots are just across the river, but that's all right. We'll, we'll put her here for keeps because we do enjoy having her. The Heritage Society I, and the museum are one organization. A lot of people separate us, but we're one organization. The museum couldn't exist without the Heritage Society because they fund us. But I always say museum because that's where my heart rests, and I have been known to do a little work in the home tour, uh, in our craft shows, and anything that we have that will support the museum of course, I'm very anxious to get out and do that. But I think another thing that has, we have been blessed with are people like Bill McNeil with the college that has brought us into working with Lee College and W.C. Smith with the school system, uh, having been our president. Because today the museum, I, I feel like, not only shows artifacts, but we, we reach out into, into the school system and we do a little bit we have become really, a, 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 I think, a pretty good educational center. The third grade in Baytown 
has their own <coughs> curriculum of, of studying the history of Baytown, and they tour our museum every year. And when you look up and you see a busload of, say, a hundred third graders coming in the front door of the museum, and you wonder, oh my goodness, what am I going to do uh, with the limited space that we have? But we have managed it. But let me tell you, I see Petey Campbell back there, and, and Al Scoen and Lee Shea that have helped out in this. And when you're a docent with a hundred third graders, don't think you can fake it. <laughs> because they have had some very good instructions on their lesson and sometimes they know more about it than you do. And you better be straightforward and you better know your history. And we tour about five of the classes a year, or most, I know five, but sometimes all of the third grades in Baytown. And then we take a field trip with these children. And usually, most of the time, we have two buses. And Petey Camel will ride one bus, and I will ride the other bus, and we are just talking tour guides all the way uh, on our field trip. We, we tour the historical markers. We go out to the Lynchburg Ferry, and we take a ferry ride. It's not a ferry ride as we know it today. It's the old ferry. And we may be, uh, during the runaway scrape, we may be playing games of history. But it, and then we come back to Balin Park, and we have a picnic. And this tour starts at 9 o'clock in the morning and ends at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And when you can find people like Petey and, and that will volunteer, sometimes three days a week, to take that type of, of field trip, that is devoted, docent, volunteer time. We have two paid employees at the museum. Patty Miller is secretary, and uh, Anne Sprode is our curator, and the rest of it is all done on volunteer work. And I guess if you added up the hours that some of us have spent there, it would be staggering the amount of volunteer hours that have been put in there. We have also toured other heritage societies, other historical commissions, from out of, out, of, out of this area. We have had several letters from people in other museums saying that this has been one of the best little museums that they have seen. And that has been a very thrill to us to, to, to hear. We were asked to do a style show for the Texas Historical Commission at their annual, at their annual meeting in Galveston. This was really an exciting thing for us to do, and I was pleased to, that we were asked and that we, we had this privilege to do this. We have reached out in the community with Lee College. We work with the Web Society uh, students in their research. They come to the museum uh, because they want to do topics on local history. We sit down and we discuss several topics that they might write about and then offer guidance on where they might go on research. If we don't have the archival material there that they could use, we suggest other places that they might go. And it's a thrill to have John Britt call us and tell us that one of the students' paper has won first place in the state that we have worked with. This is a thrill when you hear that. And this just happens year after year, and we think we have another winner this year. We work with the history fair. We're judging the history fair. The students come over and we discuss topics. And then when you see these students go on to state and to national, it's really a, a, an exciting thing to me. And we certainly appreciate Mr. Smith and his close work with the school for allowing us to have had this privilege to see some of the children that really get into the history and really begin to appreciate what Baytown really is and what we really have to offer. Some of the teachers that bring their students use the tour of the museum then as lessons. They have to do artwork on what they have seen. And we get some strange art and some very good art. And we get some letters. And I'd like to read you a couple of letters here uh, this one was uh, 
May of this year, and we went on a field trip, and we went on the ferry and had our picnic. And I thank you so very much for your time and effort. These are third graders. Thank you so very much for your time and effort for going out of your way to show us around and to be our docent. I enjoyed every bit of it. And I'm going to see if my whole family can come and see everything at the museum. Maybe we can all become members. I hope I see you again soon, your friend, Laura Westbrook. I hope her members can become, her family can become members too. Because that's what we're reaching out for, is to increase the membership. At one time, when the city had revenue sharing, this will be the last year for revenue sharing, the museum or the Heritage Society was fortunate enough to have a yearly contribution from the city. But with revenue sharing cut off, the city is no longer able to fund us. We're not like other city organizations, even though we provide a service to the city. We have a contract with the city to provide this service because they're allowing us to have a building. It would certainly be nice to have a 900,000 a year budget uh, like some organizations have, but I would be happy for $40,000 a year budget from the city, but we don't have that. So membership and donations are what the Bay Area Heritage survives on. So we hope that more children impress their family to join the Heritage Society and become members, and then maybe we will be able to get into this building sooner than we think. Here's another letter. I had a very nice time on my trip. I will come back soon. I learned a lot, and hopefully, when I grow up, I will take one of y'all's place. <laughs> My favorite part of was the ferry, and boy, was that battleship big. <laughs> you being our docent on the bus made the trip even funnier. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> and this one was written to Petey, Ms. Campbell. I enjoyed the trip with you. It was so fun, and I also learned a lot. It was the best tour I ever been on. I hope you can keep the business running until it turns old. <laughs> and I'm going to be a member. Well, you know, I hope we can keep the business running until it turns old, too. That's what I'm really looking forward to. But this, I think, if, if, you, if you want to just have a, the greatest time in the world, become a docent. Learn all the history of Baytown and work with the children because that is a real, real thrill. We had projects this year of moving the, um, our sesquicentennial project was moving the Wooster School out to the Republic of Texas Plaza. The little school has been moved. It has been partially renovated, but that's a project that we hope to ca carry on when the when the weather gets a little warmer, or when the weather gets a little cooler, Dry. or a little drier, or something. But we do uh, plan to continue that. Right now, I don't even think you can get in there. I don't think the contractor even has a street available for you to get to the little school right now with the equipment that we need. But that has been moved. One of the things that we have always wanted, and some people have looked at you, and when you said, this have a history of Baytown printed, a history of Baytown. Well, you know, Baytown wasn't created in seven days in 1917 with the discovery of oil. We've been here a long, long time. And I think when the history of Baytown was published, the, the people of Baytown found out that this is a place very, very rich in history. The Baytown history, written by Margaret Henson, Dr. Margaret Henson went on sale in September of this year. The sales have been very successful. We still have books for sale. We hope we'll always have books for sale and that we'll always have buyers. But those were two projects that we had this year that we accomplished. The next project we have is going out to, uh, to the post office and building the best museum uh, in, the Bay, in the Harris County area. 
This is called remembering the old years. I have been here.